So we're going to talk just a little bit about the different challenges of strategic planning. The first thing is the future is very uncertain. You can do all the scenario building, all the tools and everything that you want, and you can still miss stuff. And one of the problems is stuff that's kind of at the periphery, it's kind of like a weak signal um, that you don't really see or detect or even interpret it, can be the things that will take you down. Again, you look at Nokia that pretty much have a monopoly on the smartphones, and then there was this thing going on on the side and this you know quirky little computer company, and then it turned out it was Apple with the iPhone, and that wound up being the downfall of Nokia. So there's always these little cues within the environment that you have to pay attention to, but even the best analysis in the world, you'll still get blindsided. You know, there's just stuff that you can't see coming. Um, so that's a challenge. Another problem is cognitive biases and limitations of managers. I mean, one of the biggest ones is groupthink, where you got a bunch of executives at the table, they all went, you know, those of you that are interested, see my videos on isomorphism for a little bit more in-depth explanation of why this groupthink occurs. But, you know, you've got this groupthink uh, group think thing going um, where all the executives are sitting at the table together and shaking their heads yes at everything that the boss says because they all went to the same MBA program uh, they all have the same experiences the same country club um, the same everything and they just can't think outside the box they have absolutely no real imagination you know not to use a cliche another thing is top management isolation it's unfortunate but a lot of executives don't actually get out on the floor and see what's going on. Uh, they're just kind of in their little ivory tower thinking that everything is hunky-dory, but they don't actually understand that all those grand dreams they have are either not feasible, won't work. You know, just going out on the floor and asking people, hey, you know, what do you think about this? Hey, how about that? And getting that, getting that feedback is imperative. Now some of you may have watched that show Undercover Boss. I mean, it's horrifying what some of those guys or girls who are CEOs will discover when they talk to their employees at a basic level. I'm not saying you have to dress up in a wig and stuff like that. Um, certainly not, not what I'm implying. But again, just talking to managers, um, talking to, to frontline workers, it's important. Um, and then again, there's a lot of imitating what your competitors are doing as a way to avoid taking risks. And a big part of strategy is also knowing when to take risks and when not to but unfortunately winds up getting translated into just never taking any risks. Again, watch my modules on isomorphism for a little bit more uh, detail on this uh, phenomenon. Another thing you gotta watch is that planning is often mistaken for budgeting. A lot of people don't make, they think they've designed a really great budget, but budgeting is designed to support the strategic management process. It's not the same thing as a strategic management process, and that, that's an important note. They should go hand in hand, yes, but budgeting is more of a support element or a support process. And then, of course, again, there's no linkage between these grandiose plans conceived by the board of directors and the tangible day-to-day -day implementation. A big part, of th a, lot, a big thing that doesn't happen a lot, that's unfortunate, is there have to be clear milestones communicated with every single supporting initiative. So you've got the big strategy and then all the little steps need to have milestones. By this date, this needs to happen. We need this amount of money, X, Y, and Z. It needs to be very, very clear and a lot of times it's not. And you know, in the words of Otto von Bismarck, if a strategy can be miscommunicated or if an order can be miscommunicated, it will. Furthermore, critical tasks need to have somebody accountable for them. It's not to say, I need someone to do you know, whatever it is. It needs to be delegated. I need, you know, my planning officer to do this. I need human resources to support in this way. There has to be a clear accountability. That's one of the things I like about the Gantt chart. It shows the processes and who's responsible for it. I had a, uh, a colleague who explained it like this, and he is right. When you go to Korea and you look at the, the, janitor, uh, the, the bathroom, there's a picture of the janitor with their name and says, I am accountable for making sure this restroom is clean. You know, putting someone's name on things, it makes sure it gets done. And unfortunately, that's also something that doesn't happen in the strategic planning process. And of course, resources have to be committed. You may have a grand vision, but if you're not willing to commit any resource to, resources to it, financial, manpower, otherwise, 
forget it. And that's another part of strategy implementation that's a challenge. Getting people torn out of their daily routines and then focusing on some sort of a strategic project. Because yeah, they may always want to go back to what they're doing, and, and that's another problem. When you create task forces to support a strategic initiative, you almost need a separate office and maybe even a separate building to get the stuff done. Because if you let them stay in their cubicles or in their offices, they'll wind up going back to the regular work. I found it's helpful to physically move people from one point uh, to another and have them work kind of in this little physical bubble. If you'd like to know more about this, uh, I'm gonna, I have some modules on heterotopias or spaces for play, uh, but that's another video. And then of course there's poor execution. Sometimes the lower levels to say, I'm not interested in that, no, that's unrealistic, um, et cetera, et cetera. So convincing the people at the lower levels, at the tactical level, is imperative if you wish to have a great strategy. I remember I had a, um, a neighbor of mine who worked at Walmart, and this is a great example of a lack of buying and commitment at lower levels. If you ask workers at pretty much any firm, hey, do you know what the firm's strategy is? They don't have a clue. I mean, they may say, um, uh, you know, but they don't really know. Um, and so things are not communicated from the top all the way down. Every person in a firm should at least have a rudimentary, if not a precise idea of what the company's strategy is and how they're contributing to it. That will contribute to buy-in. Starbucks is a great example of this too, where they have individuals, workers, they give them uh, stock shares so that they kind of have a sense that they are an owner, so what they're doing is also in the interest of, uh, best interest of the firm. But anyhow, back to my neighbor who worked at Walmart. He didn't know what the strategy of Walmart was, and he worked selling sound. He would turn you know, music up real loud, and his boss would tell him to turn that down, and he would turn it back up and then kind of dance you know, all the way back down the aisle. Now, was he contributing to Walmart's overall strategy? No, he wasn't. He's a great example of a lack of buy-in from the lower levels. Great. So in the next couple, uh, next video, we're going to talk just a little bit more about the strategic uh, design process. Um, looking forward to seeing you then.